Well, it can be awkward waiting for something, can't it? I wonder how long you would have waited for me to start this sermon. And what would you have done as, I, as you waited? Being online, I imagine that you probably would have just fast-forwarded it until I started speaking. But imagine you couldn't. I reckon after five minutes, you would start speaking to the people around you. I reckon I would get out my phone if I was waiting for five minutes. But what if I was here looking at the screen for an hour? Would you wait for me? Or would you just give up? And would anyone wait 2,000 years? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? You can't wait 2,000 years. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years on from when Jesus promised that he would be back. And here we are, still waiting. Why is he taking so long? And what are we meant to be doing while we wait for him? Well, these are the two questions that we're going to explore as we look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me first remind you where we've been in 2 Peter. In chapter 1, we saw that the true knowledge of Jesus is productive. It's knowledge that we're saved by grace. And we saw Peter's motivation. He wants us to remain on this knowledge, even after he's gone. And then last week in chapter 2, we were reminded that Jesus is coming again as judge. And so we're to flee from those with false knowledge. And this leads us into chapter 3, where we see two questions and answers about Jesus' coming. And these two questions and answers will be our points for today. The first question comes from those who scoff at Jesus' return. Their question is, where is this coming he promised? And Peter's answer helps us to find encouragement while we wait. And the second question is from Peter. Since the world will be destroyed, what kind of people ought we be? And his answer helps us know how to live as we wait for Jesus. So let's look at our first question and answer. Where is this coming he promised? Scoffers will come asking where Jesus is, saying that, Je- saying that life just seems to keep on going and going like nothing has changed. But Peter's answer to the scoffers gives great hope. There are good reasons Jesus hasn't come back yet. We can find encouragement as we wait. Let's read the question and answer from verse 3 of chapter 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Peter warns us that scoffers will come. They will question us. Where is this coming he promised? And they're going to argue that nothing's really changed since the creation of the world. Everything just seems to remain the same. 2,000 years on from this, we really feel the weight of this question. It does look like nothing's changed, but life just keeps continuing. He hasn't come back yet, and so why should we expect him to come back? But Peter answers them, and he says they are deliberately forgetting what's changed. They are forgetting that God who created the world with his word, has also destroyed the world with water in the time of Noah. 
And this same God, with his word, has promised to come back and judge. Things have changed since the creation of the world. We've seen judgment come. We have a promise that it's coming again. Don't be like the scoffers. Don't forget this. Remember it. We have a promise that Jesus is coming. Next, Peter addresses their question. Where is this coming he promised? And from our understanding of time, it looks like he's being slow, doesn't it? He must be behind schedule. Maybe he's forgotten. 2,000 years seems like a long time. But this is a problem with us and how we understand slowness. Not a problem with God. It's misunderstanding God's timetable. Peter reminds us, God isn't slow. He isn't late. He hasn't forgotten. Rather, God is patient. And he's being patient so that more people can be saved. God's patience means that more people will live with him forever. Each year, millions of people around the world become Christian. How good is that? This is why God is waiting. God isn't slow to keep his promises. We are the ones with the wrong understanding of God's timetable. And when Jesus comes, he's going to come like a thief. It will be instant. And at this time, the world will be destroyed. And all that we've done will be laid before God. We don't know when. We don't know God's timetable. And you're not going to get a fortnight's notice. You don't get one last phone call. You won't even be given time to finish your coffee. The warning is now. He will come like a thief. In Australia, we love knowing the exact time of things. If you want to get somewhere, you look at the timetable. Google Maps will tell you exactly to the minute how long it is to drive somewhere or exactly how long it is to walk somewhere. If you're catching the train, you can find the exact time the train will come and the exact time you'll arrive at your destination. It's the same for a bus, for an Uber. We love knowing timetables. And on top of that, it's annoying when something is late, when the train is delayed, when a bus is late, when the drive is longer than expected. The other day, it took me 15 minutes to drive one kilometer and I was late to where I was meant to be. I hated it. I hated the feeling of being late. We really love timetables to be accurate. And it's easy to get annoyed when things are running late. And it's tempting to apply the same idea to God's timetable. It looks like God is late. But that's not a problem with God. It's a problem with our expectations. God's timetable doesn't work that way. God is not slow. Don't scoff that he hasn't come yet. He hasn't come because he's patient. He has a plan and he's sticking to it. And he's giving time for people to be saved. We have a good God who wants more people to be saved. It's good for us to know this, to praise God that people are being saved. Be encouraged by the good reason for the wait. But some of us here will want Jesus to be taking longer. It can be tempting to to not want Jesus to come back just yet. And there can be some good reasons for that. But most of the time, it it actually comes back to our own desires. After all, after all, we have plans. We have five-year plans, 10-year plans. We have plans for what we want retirement to look like. And there are still things that we want to achieve in this life. We don't want Jesus to come back right now. But again, this is wanting him to fit in with our timetable. God has a plan and he's sticking to it. He will come back like a thief with no warning. And so instead of God wanting God to fit in with our timetable, we need to look to his timetable. We can trust that God has a good plan and Jesus will return at the right time. Be encouraged by the wait for Jesus. Well, our first question was, where is this coming, he promised. And we've been reminded that things have changed since the beginning of the world. And we've been encouraged by the reasons for the wait. He wants more people to be saved. But when he comes, it will be like a thief and the world will be destroyed. 
And this leads us into our second question. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Now, this is a question from Peter. And as he answers it, we see what it means to wait. And it's not about just sitting back, doing nothing until he comes. We are to live holy and godly lives. Read along with me from verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, back in chapter 2, the false teachers live as if the world's going to remain. They indulge in their sinful desires and never stop sinning. Their priority is life here and now. But this passage reminds us the world is going to be destroyed. And this has a significant impact on how we live today. We don't sit back and relax. We don't indulge in our sin. We don't even live in fear of the destruction. But we live holy and godly lives. Holy lives are lives that reflect God's character. They are lives that are separate from the corrupt nature of the world. And we've already seen in 2 Peter what godliness looks like. In chapter 1, we were encouraged to grow in godliness. And it was very clear about what that looks like. It's growing in godliness, knowledge, perseverance. And we do this remembering we have been cleansed from our past sin. This gives us a picture of what it means to live a holy and godly life. And we do this in eager expectation of the life to come. We look ahead to the new heaven, the new earth. And in this new heaven and earth, righteousness dwells. This is a place that God himself dwells. No corruption, no sin. This is the great hope that we have. So as we look ahead, it's important we remain in the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes us spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And we're to remain like this. But it doesn't just happen by accident. Verse 14 picks up a phrase that was common in chapter 1. It says to make every effort. We're to make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. As we look ahead to heaven, Peter wants us to remain in our secure position in Christ, to live as people saved by a true knowledge of Jesus. Now, my family used to go on holidays to the beach pretty often. One of my favorite things to do at the beach uh, was to dig a hole. And I'll just dig and dig and dig. I could dig for ages. I wanted to dig until we had to go home. I really enjoyed doing it. But at the end of the day, I had to destroy the hole. You can't just leave a big hole at the beach as much as I try to convince my parents we could. And so no matter how shallow, no matter how deep the hole was, it had to be destroyed at the end of the day. But then the next day, the next time we were at the beach, I'll just do it again, right? I would dig and dig and dig. And then at the end of the day, I would destroy it. Now, it was fun at the time, but imagine if that was actually my whole life. Imagine I started investing in just digging holes. Imagine I gave up my job to live at the beach. I wonder how big of a shovel I could buy. And then every morning I get up, I dig a hole, I destroy it, and then I go to bed. But since the hole is going to be destroyed, how should I live? Should I spend my life focused on the hole? Do I give up everything to focus on it? And of course not. It gets destroyed. And in the same way, we're encouraged not to stay focused on this world. This world will perish. We don't live like the false teachers or the scoffers. 
who scoff and follow their own desires. We look ahead to a world to come. And as we look ahead, it affects what we do here and now. We live holy and godly lives. We put our evil desires to death. And knowing the future, it affects the plans that we have now. Often when we plan, we focus on our desires and what we want to do in the world. We know what we want to achieve in 10 years. Things like marriage, promotions, buying a house, spending more time with grandkids. And it's easy to go through life just looking ahead to retirement. And some of these things can be good. It can be good to think ahead but we can't idolize them. The world will be destroyed. And this year has been a cruel reminder that we can't plan everything. We aren't in control. And this has destroyed the hopes of many people. People who put their hope in this life have been absolutely rattled. But the good news for those who trust in Jesus, we're not looking forward to perfection here on earth. It can't be found here. We're looking ahead to heaven where the problems and the suffering in the world will be gone and we will live with God forever. And this is why when we plan our year as a church, we make plans that will last. We make plans to grow in Christ. And we make these plans because that's how we want to live our lives as we wait for Jesus. We want to be growing more and more like Jesus, to be actively waiting for him to return. And so if you haven't already, make it your plan to grow in Christ. Plan to live for him now and plan to live with him forever. And we've also been reminded by this passage, God wants people to be saved. And the time for people to be saved is now. And this really hits home for all of us. We all know people that we're desperate to see saved. We all have people that we want to see know Christ. And as a church, we want people knowing Christ. We want to see the people that we've named on our Making Christ Known board. We want them to know Christ, to repent, to say sorry for following their own way, and to start living for Jesus. And there's really encouraging news here. The news is that there is still time, and God wants people to be saved. What a great encouragement as we wait for Jesus, that there is still time for the people we know to follow Jesus. And I hope you're really motivated by this. I hope you expect to see people say yes to Jesus. And I hope you take this opportunity to tell people about Jesus, to offer them eternal life with God. Now, I know a lot of us have been taking these opportunities. And so I hope this motivates you. Persevere. Keep encouraging them to repent and live for Jesus. But we've also been reminded that we can't take this time for granted. The world will be destroyed, and we don't know when. So take every opportunity you can to tell people about Jesus, to tell them that he saves them by his grace because of his righteousness, and that when Jesus returns, those who trust in him will live with him forever. And this urgency doesn't mean we need to be pushy and annoying, forcing people to make a decision. But we can't just be lazy. We can't just sit back, not expecting people to say yes to Jesus. Be active as you wait for Jesus to return. Well, today we've seen the answer to two questions. First, where is Jesus coming? And we saw the good reason for the wait. God is patient. He wants people to be saved. He wants people to know Jesus. And second, since the world is going to be destroyed, how should we live? We were reminded to live holy and godly lives as we wait for our great hope of spending eternity with God. As we wrap up our time exploring to Peter, let me draw your attention to the last few verses that helpfully summarize what we've already been reminded of in 2 Peter. Follow along with me from verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless. 
and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Well, we've all been told what is to come. We've all been forewarned. And so we are to be on our guard. Be aware that false teachers will come. And make sure you're not carried away by them. Their teaching is false. Instead, remain in your secure position in Christ. Jesus is our Lord and Saviour. He is the one who saved us from the corruption of the world. And when he returns, we will be with him forever. Remain in the true knowledge that Jesus is coming to judge. And there is really good reason for the wait. He wants people to be saved through Jesus. And so as we wait, keep making every effort to live holy and godly lives as we look ahead to a new heaven and earth. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of 2 Peter. Thank you for the reminder to remain with Jesus. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is coming. Please grow us in godliness and holiness as we wait for him. Help us to live knowing that this world is going to be destroyed and that we will live forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen.